before Christ, and we're going to end up like in 1900 here. And so these are philosophers who've really led to what Boghossian is saying. And so how do we get to what he's saying, that all Christians are crazy? This is a run-through of, of where these ideas have come from. So the pre-Socratics, essentially what they were saying, they were trying to understand the world without using mythology and gods. A lot of people, when they're trying to figure out where do people come from, where do mountains come from, where do trees come from, they will say the gods created them. And these people are thinking, well, that's probably not true because I don't really think there are gods, so there should be natural explanations for stuff. And so someone like Thales is going to say, well, it's all just based on water. Pythagoras is going to say it's all based on numbers. Some, you know, Heraclitus is going to say it's all based on change. Democritus is going to say there are these things called atoms at the core of everything. And so all these people are trying to provide us naturalistic explanations for things. Then comes along Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. And these, these, these are way over generalizations and simplifications of these guys. But Plato, remember, somebody said everything in philosophy is just a footnote on Plato because he was so important. And so Plato, or for Socrates, the bottom line is question everything. And if someone comes to you and says, he asks you, you know, how are you doing today? And you say, great. He goes, really? Are you doing great? Well, sure, I'm doing great. Are there any problems in your life? Well, yeah, you know, whatever. My car broke down. So is it really great? Well, I guess not. And so he asks these questions to kind of mess people up. Plato, he's going to say reality's up there. Remember we looked at that painting by Raphael and Plato was standing there pointing to the sky because he says reality is in the ideal, which is way up there like in heaven or something. Aristotle, he was the guy who was pointing down, and he's going to say, actually, if you want to know about reality, don't think about ideals. You want to know about reality, put something under a microscope and look at what it's made of and see what the, what the components are. So these are two different ways of trying to figure out how we know things. One is to think of the ideal. The other is to take a look at reality itself. We have this guy named Augustine. And Augustine is really more of a theologian than a philosopher, but he does a lot of important stuff for philosophy. Most people identify Augustine as the Christian who mixes the Bible with philosophy, and specifically Plato. A lot of people don't like the idea that he used a lot of Platonic ideas to describe God. But I would, I would argue, and if you look on this white, well, you are looking at the white sheet because you're writing on it. So at the bottom right, I would suggest that we shouldn't really blame Augustine for bringing Platonic ideas into Christianity because I think the Bible has a lot of Platonic ideas in it. Well, I think we looked like Hebrews where there's an idea of the tabernacle that is in heaven and the tabernacle here is just a copy of it. That's very Platonic. Check out this idea in Colossians 3. If then you have been raised with Christ... So this idea is that, you know, God is up here with Christ. Is Jesus in bodily form right now? So when it says Jesus is with the Father, is he bodily? So you could actually touch him, touch his skin. Is he bodily? Yeah, you think so? body ascended into heaven. That's what the Bible says. Yeah. And the angels say, just as you've seen him go, he's going to come back this way. So, back. so yeah, it, it's hard for us to imagine this because he's not on earth. But wherever Jesus is, he is still bodily. Like, you could touch him and, and he could eat things. So, kind of weird. But Christ is with God. So, it says, if you've been raised with Christ, if you are a believer, seek the things that are above. That's very platonic language where Christ is seated at the right hand of God or the Father, set your mind on things that are above because, you know, you're down here. So actually you are with Christ, so you're there, but you're also on earth with a bunch of other people. So are you in two places at once? Yeah, sort of. That's what it says here. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. 
For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you, uh, then you also will appear with him in glory. So this idea of there's an ideal, but then there's a sort of copy of you on earth, this is from Paul. And somebody who had, had, had read, read a lot of Plato and knew Plato would go, oh, yeah, I understand that idea because that's, that's from Plato. So Augustine, I, don't, I think it's, don't think it's so much that he invented this idea of bringing Platonic ideas. I think it's, it's there largely. Okay, Anselm. We looked at him a little bit. He is the one who articulates this idea of faith seeking understanding. So he is the one that comes up with that phrase, basically, faith seeking understanding. And we talked about this a little bit. We'll unfold it more later. But Anselm is doing metaphysics before epistemology. There's those big words. Metaphysics, this is the question of what is, starts with R, ends with eel, real. real. Yes, so what is real precedes the question what is true. Tr true. true, yes. So Anselm says, I want to know what's real, and then I will go from that to figure out how I know things. So that's Anselm. Then Descartes, we've talked a lot about him, don't need to spend a lot of time here. Uh, Descartes is, oh no, look at this. Back all the way back here. Okay, so Descartes would be what we would call a radical rationalist or radical rationalism. Remember, we looked at the difference between rationalism and empiricism. That was a long time ago. I think we did that last Friday. Uh, so, rationalism, these are people who would say, Two plus two is four, and I know that in my head. I don't need to do an experiment by the definitions of all those terms. I just know that this is true. And so he switches us around to this sort of, to this sort of idea where I need to understand what is reasonable and what makes sense. And once I figure that out, then I'm going to go on to figure out what is what I can believe. I wanted to draw your attention to this green sheet. On the front of it, a lot of words there. I just want to point out a couple things here. Because these two guys, Anselm and Descartes, understanding them is pivotal for understanding why someone like Peter Bogosian would say the things he says and where we are today. And what's interesting is when you look at Anselm and Descartes, and Anselm wrote this book, uh, the Proslogian, and Descartes writes a number of books, but one is the Meditations. And if we're to compare and contrast those, what's interesting is a comparison between Anselm and Descartes is that both of these authors tried to prove the existence of God from the starting point of what? Starting point of the mind. And so they want to prove the existence of God some people will go, look, there's a tree. Aren't trees awesome? There must be a God. But what Anselm and Descartes are doing is they want to just stay in their head, and they want to prove God from their mind. And this is known as, and go ahead and underline this statement or this phrase. This is known as the ontological argument for God's existence. That's a lot of technical stuff there. But it's just this idea that we can prove God's existence just from our own heads. And so they both are trying to do this. If you look at Anselm, so he says, therefore, Lord, you who grant understanding to faith, grant that insofar as you know it is useful for me, I may understand that you exist as we believe you exist. So I believe you are, so will you help me with this? And that you are what we believe you to be. So I'm going to believe in God, and then I'm going to ask him to help me prove that he is really there. Now, we believe that you are, and underline this phrase, because this is sort of tricky to get your mind around, but this is what Anselm is saying. We believe that you are, and here's, here's what he thinks about God. Something than which nothing greater can be thought. You ever track with that? So he's saying, 
God is that than which nothing greater can be thought. So think about your car, like if you have a car. Can you think of a better car than your car? Yeah. Like any other car in the world? <laughs> or you, you eat a hamburger, you go to Five Guys, eat a hamburger. Can you think of a better hamburger than that hamburger? Like, well, yeah, I could go buy a $20 hamburger. That'd probably be better. Uh, you go on a vacation to, you know, Crater Lake. Can you think of a better vacation? Like, yeah, if I went to Hawaii, that might be better. And so what Anselm was saying is that if you can think of something better than what you're thinking of, what you're thinking of isn't the best. So he's saying God is the best thing that we can think of. Does that make sense? So there has to be something that's better than everything else. And he's going to say, one of the properties of the best thing is that it exists. Because something that exists is better than something that doesn't exist. Does that make sense? So he's going to say, since God is that thing which is the best, God must exist. And that's his proof. Is that convincing to you? For most people, it's not. And so check out what Descartes does. And so, because Descartes not like an atheist who's trying to disprove God. He's trying to do basically the same thing. So on this account, I am here desirous to inquire further whether I, who possess this idea of God, could exist supposing there were no God. So in other words, what Descartes has done, you guys remember Spock from Star Trek? Yeah. Spock, you know, what, what is it about Spock? What is, he's a Vulcan? Yeah, Vulcan. And what are Vulcan? Vul Vulcans are Vulcan. illogical. Is that right? They're super logical. They're super logical. And, and so Spock... If you tell him something that's illogical, he'll point it out to you. And so Descartes is basically saying, I can, go, I can do this process, and I can become Spock. I can just be logic. I don't have any influences of mine, no presuppositions, no weakness of emotion, no passion, any of that stuff. I am just logic. I am just Spock. And so he says, since I've reached this state of Spockness, is that a word, Spockness? So, so if you think of what it would be like, to have no passion, no emotional influence, no presuppositions. I'm just straight logic. And he thinks he's reached that stage. And he says, OK, so I'm, I'm Spock. And I have this idea of God. So since I'm just all logic, that idea must have come from God himself. He must have planted it in my mind because I don't have any presuppositions. So he's saying, OK, since I have this idea of God, he probably exists. So, and then you can see underneath there, they're both going to try and do this in totally different ways. So under the Anselm, we don't need to read all of this, but that's at the end of that second paragraph there. For I do not seek to understand in order to believe. So I don't need to understand this. I'm in order to do this. I believe in order to understand. For I also believe that unless I believe, I shall not understand. So he is, and I underline this, but you might want to just make a note by this. So Anselm saying, I'm disregarding myself. I'm giving myself up. And you'll notice what he does. He just starts quoting a bunch of scripture. It's like, God, help me, help me to see you. And so he's praying to God, and he uses tons of scripture to, as his starting point. Descartes, when you go down there, the, towards the bottom of that long paragraph. Today, then, since I have opportunely uh, freed my mind from all cares and am happily disturbed by no passions, I'm Spock. I have nothing in here but just reason and logic. And since I am in the secure possession of leisure in a peaceful retirement, I will at length apply myself earnestly and freely to the general overthrow of all my former opinions. So what he's doing is, like, I'm disregarding authority, and I'm only regarding myself. So what Descartes does is huge because he's getting rid of authority, and he's just himself. All right, let's fill these in real quick, and we'll fill in by these blanks later. But these are the important names. David Hume. David, you guys heard of David Hume before? He's a Scottish guy, kind of interesting. And whereas Descartes is radical rationalism, Hume, we're going to see, probably when we get back from break, is extreme empiricism. So whereas Descartes takes the mind to, you know, like I believe things because they're in my head, he takes that to its logical conclusion. Hume, it's going to be interesting to see, 
He takes that to its logical conclusion. And then we have Immanuel Kant, who is probably the most important philosopher after, after Plato. So Kant is huge. And he is known, in fact, he labeled this himself, the Copernican revolution in philosophy. And this is a really famous term. If you take any philosophy class, they're going to throw that around. That Kant brought about the Copernican. What, what did Copernicus do? What was he famous? Anybody remember? Um, the, the, the yeah, yeah, because people used to think the Earth is here and the sun goes around the Earth. Well, what does he say? No, it's the other way around. It's the sun is in the middle and the Earth goes around it. So that's a huge paradigm shift. And what Kant is going to do is he's going to give us a totally different way of thinking of reality. And it's going to be pretty spacey and trippy. So make sure you do a lot of resting over spring break because your mind will be blown when you get to, when you get to Kant. The next oh. is this guy named Schleiermacher, Frederick Schleiermacher. That's just a fun name to say. OK, say it with me. One, two, three. Schleiermacher. Don't you feel better no. just saying that? Schleiermacher is, technically, he's really more of a theologian than a philosopher. But as Christians, it's important to look at this guy because he does theology and Christianity in a totally different way than anybody before him. And his most famous saying, so this is Schleiermacher. I should, that should be a test question. Is how do you, I should put like five different spellings of that. I had a history professor do that. He talked about this just obscure German general or something in World War II. And one of his test questions, he had like six different spellings. It's like, what is the correct spelling of no. the general? I'm like, ah, give me a break. And I, at that moment, I vowed I would never do that to my students. Okay, Yay. So spell it however you want. Feel free. Have fun with that. But Schleiermacher said, and this is his important contribution, he says that religion is the feeling of absolute dependence. Religion, the core of religion, is the feeling of absolute dependence. And you can add God to that if you want. But what he says, it's not that religion is believing something. Religion is the feeling of absolute dependence. So is there a word in there that sticks out to us as good evangelicals Fundamentalists, well, dependence, but also what? Feeling. We're not about feeling. We're about logic and thinking and the Bible and doctrine and theology. And so when he says feeling, anybody ever had your feelings lead you astray? It, was anybody ever in middle school here and just did stupid <laughs> stuff? Yeah, we all did. And so to think about this idea of religion being the feeling, oh my goodness, this, is, this leads us in some really interesting places. The next person, I think Kierkegaard is, for me, Kierkegaard is the most fun of all these people. I sort of have a philosophy crush on Kierkegaard. Okay? I don't know if there is such a thing, but I, he is awesome. Kierkegaard is amazing, and we'll talk about him some. But he's the one, you guys heard this phrase, leap of faith. Really, it's, it's this idea of a leap into faith. It's not exactly like you just close your eyes and jump off a cliff. There's more to it than that. But, he, but faith is really important to him. What you can see is different feelings versus faith. That's, that's an important distinction, isn't it? And then Friedrich Nietzsche. You guys have probably heard of Nietzsche. Uh, and his most famous saying is that God is what? God is dead. And by that, he doesn't mean like I've killed God. He means that if you look around us, and I think it's true today, most people live as if there is no God. And so he's just acknowledging that if we live in the West, chances are we live our lives with everyone thinking about God. And what Nietzsche says is that if God really is dead, then we shouldn't be living according to Christian morality and Christian ethics, which everybody does. But he says, when we stop living by Christian ethics and morals, everything's going to go really bad. And he predicts World War I. He predicts the Holocaust. He predicts uh, the Soviet Union with millions of people dying. So, well, he doesn't say like this is going to, he doesn't say like there's going to be this thing called World War I and a guy named Hitler. But he says, when we stop living according to Christian ethics, since everything is based on it, 
it is going to be totalitarian hell, basically. Because there, what other morals do we have besides just the strongest survive? And he's the one who has this term called Ubermensch, which is like the Superman. And rather than living according to Christian morality, the idea is that everybody has to be the strongest, and the strongest survive. Yeah. So, he, so he's, a, he's a prophet, probably not the way that we really want to think about it. Okay, So a couple quotes, I just put it up here. Dawkins says some stuff, good old Dawkins. And this one, I, I want you to look at this one. This is, this is kind of the mantra of the modern idea of belief. This is W.K. Clifford. I don't think he's the big red dog. I think this is a different Clifford here. So he says, it is wrong. When is it wrong? Always. Where is it wrong? Everywhere. Who is it wrong for? Anyone. To do what? So that's a pretty broad statement. It's, it's always wrong everywhere for everybody to believe anything upon insufficient evidence. That's, so, so it is immoral for you to believe anything without enough evidence. So I want to switch real quick. This is a reminder of what we looked at about rationalism and empiricism. And it's our final. <clears throat> Are these statements true or false? An empiricist, I know 2 plus 2 is 4 based on reason alone. A rationalist, I know 2 plus 2 is 4 based on experience alone. True or false? False. False, the other way. Because the rationalist is going to say, I never have to see two things and another two things. I just know this in my head. <laughs> are these statements true or false? An empiricist says, I know boxes are square because I've seen them. A rationalist, I know boxes are square because, by definition, boxes are square. Is that true? Yeah, so you see the difference here. How about this one? Who can answer this better? What color is Cookie Monster? An empiricist or a rationalist? An empiricist. Empiricist? How come? They can see. They go off what they've seen. And what, like if they watched it, they can see it as Yeah, and there's nothing inherent in Cookie Monster that tells us about color. Like, I know he's a, a monster. And I've seen a lot of Sesame Street. That's what I grew up on. So I know monsters can be different colors. Yeah, Isaac? I would say the rest was because Cookie Monster is not a general thing. It's like in your example on yeah. Friday, there was the example of a cat where you can know the definition of this cat. I mean, he gave it, he knows his cat is ginger. Well, we know that Cookie Monster, because he's a specific thing, we know he is defined as a blue monster that eats cookies. But if you've never seen him, all you are given, even if, even if you're just given there exists a Cookie Monster, would you know that from that definition, oh, he's blue? No, you haven't seen it. Yeah, and maybe there's green cookie monsters. Maybe there's purple oh, ones. Maybe there's red that. ones. Because my uncle's color bunny only sees green. So he, thinks so he, he would be green. green. Ah, now we're going to Kant stuff. Yes, so uh, it, it could be that all cookie monsters are blue, but there's nothing in that definition that says he has to be. So that would probably be like a synthetic statement that Cookie Monster is blue, and maybe once I've seen every single Cookie Monster in the world and they're all blue, then I can, but it would still be an empiricist type idea here. Who can answer this better? What would a bridge between San Francisco and Hawaii look like? Would a rationalist or an empiricist? Why do you think a rationalist, Mr. Because Schreiber? Because there isn't a bridge between San Francisco and Hawaii. Like you can use logic and well, there's a big gap, so therefore, bridge has to be really big, really long, have a, and need to have a bunch of support structures that are probably Yeah, there. so in your head you can maybe formulate that, and you might borrow a, tr you know, like if I've seen the Golden Gate Bridge, I might just imagine that extended really, really far. So that would be empiricist, where you look at something you've seen in the Bay of San Francisco, you've seen looking out from San Luis, but you can't see Hawaii, you know, it has to be really long. Yeah, so, so it, it So it could be a combination of these, wouldn't it? It's it's like I know what what Golden Gate Bridge looks like, and so I'm going to superimpose that, you know, do Google Maps or something and see from one to the other, okay? So the bottom line is this, this is where we're going to end is that if we're starting with our brain, like not believe, but we're starting with our brain, there's still a lot of problems because maybe I'm a brain in a vat which means you're not even going on spring break next week. You're just going to be sitting in that vat. Someone's going to tell you you're on spring break. 
Another question, how do you know there are other minds out there? How do you know the person sitting next to you has a mind? Because there's ah, It could be faking it though. Origin, like, so there's a lot of questions. Okay, so real quick, real quick. Um, Friday is going to be the screw tape test. It's gonna be online. It is not gonna be memorizing anything or so you can use your book. There will be, right now I haven't put it all together, but I'm thinking there will be something, a video to watch and then respond to it. So I'm gonna try that, to have that up this afternoon so that you can jump on it and be totally done. So no, so we won't be meeting in class for Friday. It's just an online quit test. Monday when we get back, we'll have fun. Yeah, all right. Have a great break, guys. Relax, have fun. See ya.